Well, good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Sunday night Bible study. I hope you've had a wonderful day today with family and worshiping the Lord in spirit and truth. And tonight, we're going to continue our study in the book of First Peter. So please get your Bibles out, open them up to the book of First Peter. And I'll remind you that we studied First Peter, and we finished in chapter 3, verse 7 last week. And we began our study in verse 13 of chapter 2. And that whole section, we noticed how Peter addresses the attitude and disposition of humility and submission in three different major areas of life. The first one is in our submission to the government, to leaders within the government, the different levels of areas of of law and governors and mayors and 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 of course back then emperors or as we have in this nation a president and the necessity for us to do that very thing and submit and we talked about the different variances within that we then got to verse 18 and he talks about servants being submissive to their masters or to their bosses and so now it's the workplace area of submission. And then he brings it all the way to the household, to the very intimate relationship of husband and wife. And we spoke on that last week, and that's where we finished. We finished in verse 7 of chapter 3. And tonight what we're going to do is pick up in verse 8, where he's going to build on what he's already talked about in chapter 2, starting in verse 13, all the way through chapter 3, verse 7. He's going to give us further instruction, some more detail on, on how we can go about expressing and, and, and living out that submissive life, that submissive attitude, those submissive actions. Look to verse 8, 1 Peter chapter 3. To sum up, let all be harmonious. Let's 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 all sing the same tune let's 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 be in one accord with one another let's 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 shoot for having our 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 tones match up so to sum up let all be harmonious sympathetic brotherly kind-hearted humble in spirit now to sum up everything he's talked about to to apply to our attitude toward the government, our, our attitude to our, our bosses and our workplace, to our co-workers, our attitude towards a husband or towards a wife, to sum all these things up. Apply this, these things as your goal, these things as your as your guidance, as your attitude. Be in harmony with people. Shoot for that. Be, 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 be sympathetic, no understanding. And man, is this an important thing? I, I touched base on it last week just a little bit. I want to mention it again. That it's important for us to try to think about the other people and, and the weight of the things on their shoulders, what's going on in their lives, the responsibilities that they have, the, the life situations that they're going through. And being sympathetic about the challenges that other people face. And it's amazing when we start to try to slip on their shoes. When we try to slip into their lives and start to picture what they're going through. How, how, it, how it begins to set our feelings aside. And it starts to get us to focus on what we can do to help create at least between us something that isn't stressful. But harmonious. Something that isn't a battlefield. But where there's peace, something that isn't something that they feel stressed out about, but a place where we can help and serve and give and care and share. And so being sympathetic carries more than just an emotional thing. It, it carries with it then actions that help relieve and release people from things, which then helps with being harmonious. It helps us with that brotherly relationship, that intimate relationship that comes with family. It takes now the, 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 the national or the professional and it puts it into a personal. Try to have that 
relationship with each other, that brotherly relationship. Kindness and being kind-hearted, again, goes along with being sympathetic, but it's it's having that, that kind disposition, trying to, trying to give kindness to others. And of course, humble in spirit, not trying to get our way, not trying to put ourselves above others, but allowing ourselves to be humble in our attitude of peace and gentleness as we approach life situations. And then he says in verse 9, not returning evil for evil or insult for insult, but give a blessing instead. Wow, what a concept. Try to find a kind thing to do, a kind thing to say, a, a, a gentle response, a gentle offering. Instead of being hit with something and taking it really so deep and personal that we re respond with something evil, we, we respond with, with something that is an insult back. Now, the world's great at that. You know, for us to counteract what the world and the way the world tends to handle things is to handle things with the weapons that God tells us to handle them with, with the responses God tells us to respond with. And let's watch how that weapon works. When, when somebody curses, respond with a blessing. When somebody tries to insult, respond with a kind word. When somebody tries to tear down, well, lift up. And that takes training, right? I mean, we've talked about this time and time again. But it takes th those... Um, what I try to do is I try to, I, I've referred to this before, and, and I'm sure I'll say it again, so please forgive me, but I refer to who I was before I was baptized as dead Tad, because he no longer lives. He was dead to begin with spiritually, but he was buried. I was buried with Christ through baptism, and then I was raised up a newness of life. So the old me is buried and done and dead and gone away with. But here's the blessing that I intimately know the dead Tad. I mean, I spent a lot of time with him and I watched what he was like. And I, I, I experienced the experiences that he went through. I, I watched the, and intimately saw the sins and the knucklehead responses that he had situation to situation. And I have learned to great extents from his experience. And I continue to learn from the mistakes and the sins and the poor gestures and responses that I still make today. And that's why it's a good idea for us to, to do those self-evaluations, both from the past dead us to then those situations of our past that we can learn from and go, man, what is it that I could have done differently? How could I have handled that situation? How could I have disengaged quicker? How could I have not taken that moment or that phrase, that idea so personally that I lashed out? How could I have taken a breath and counted to 10? How could I have put in into my mind the, the ability to start looking for something good to say, something positive to respond back to instead of lashing out with an insult or lashing out with something that's evil? And so it takes work. It takes discipline. It's that, it's that workout that, that we have in life. But we want to improve, don't we? We want to become better. We want to become stronger at being able to respond with grace and kindness and brotherly love as opposed to an insult or evil. To do that, it takes time and it takes training. It takes discipline. It takes prayer. It takes faith. It takes equipping. It takes, you know, studying together going through situational discussions. I love when I have conversations with people and I have the opportunity to role play a little bit, you know, to, to work through situations that maybe they've been through or I've been through and talk through those situations to help better equip for the next time that time shows up because you know it will. You know that there's going to come a time within a marriage that one of the husband or wife says something that's not nice, that's evil, that's that's an insult, or does something that's dumb or hurtful. And you know that there's going to come a time within marriage, the necessity then for the person who's receiving that bad word or that bad action to then respond. And how are we going to respond? 
And man, wouldn't it be great if we, if we each within our marriages learned how to respond when the other one messed up in a way that was responding with grace and love and kindness. With, as he says, responding with something that's good instead of an insult. And so he then continues on in verse 9. For you were called for the very purpose that you might inherit a blessing. For what purpose? To offer something good. To offer a blessing instead of responding with an insult or evil. We were bought with a price. He goes on to say, verse 10, Let him who means to love life and see good days refrain his tongue from evil and his lips from speaking guile. And let him turn away from evil and do good. Let him seek peace and pursue it. For the eyes of the Lord are upon the righteous and his ears attend to their prayer. But to the face of But the face of the Lord is against those who do evil. And so we see here that that Peter is quoting out of the book of Psalms, Psalm 34. And as he does, he gives us further instruction on how to actually apply what he said and written in verse 9. That we refrain, we teach our tongue to hold back. Sounds like something that we could turn to the book of James to study a little bit more about. And that we turn away from evil, that we, we have an opportunity to, to turn from those things and then turn back to do good. And then we know that the, the eyes of the Lord are watching us. He sees what we're going through and he tells us about the avenue of prayer that we have and seeking God's strength and his wisdom and guidance as we face those difficult situations. Practical words for us to apply to everyday life. Verse 13, and who is there to harm you if you prove zealous for what is good? But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you're blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled, but sanctify or set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you yet with gentleness and reverence. Man, we could spend a series of lessons on this section. We're not right now. But I want you that within the context of what we're looking at, see how this all fits together. That really when somebody treats us evil or somebody treats us with with something that's insulting, it's an opportunity for them to see God Sometimes it is very best through us. When somebody tries to give us an opportunity for us to suffer or for us to be angry, we can respond with God's grace and love, with his mercy and kindness. We can respond with prayer. And when we respond this way, it gives people a chance to see the hope that lives within us. The spirit that lives within us, the truth that lives within us, the Jesus, the Christ, the Messiah that lives within us. And so as people have a chance to actually witness then the hope of God in us by our actions toward them, it will then turn many to then start questioning us as to why we responded the way that we did. Or how can we have that hope and peace in the midst of turmoil and suffering? And it's another opportunity for us to share the beauty of Jesus Christ And how with his power, his strength, his grace, his leadership, his love alive in us. When when, when we show people him that way, it leads us to be a witness for him in that way. And we can explain and have a ready answer for the hope. And so maybe just a little side note, what is the ready answer that you would have? Somebody starts questioning you about Jesus. They've seen you at work and handling the stress of workplace situations or when the boss really comes down on you or the, or the group that you're a part of and you respond in a loving and kind way and, and you, 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 you turn and, and you pray and, and you set yourself up to offer a, a word of, of kindness. 
and people start then questioning you, what would be your answer for the hope that lies within you that revealed itself through the way that you handled that stressful suffering situation? Again, I think it's another one of those opportunities as we study this word for us to think about the areas that we may have strengths and weaknesses in, both in our responses to situations as in our attitude and action, but also our responses when it comes to an opportunity for us to share. Share the testimony of Jesus living within us. Share who Jesus is using God's word as our guide. And maybe that's not a strength of yours. Maybe you can articulate some of the things that that Jesus has done in your life personally, and that's a great thing to, to do. But being able to then take it to the testimony from God's truth, to open up the the reality of Jesus actually being alive again. Those are great things to be equipped for as well. Verse 14 again, But even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, you are blessed, and do not fear their intimidation, and don't be troubled. Remember how, you know, what, what, what they do to, to us, they actually do to Jesus, right? When somebody sins against us, they, they sin against God. And we may be the ones who are the recipients right on the front line here on earth, but they're sinning against the Lord. And so as we see somebody sinning, even if it's sinning against us, we should want for them what God wants for them. And that's for them to be saved. Remember how we already read earlier on in this book? How we're reminded that that we were the ones that, that reviled against God, that we sinned against Jesus, and yet he still gave himself for us anyway? That his response to us was, hey, listen, I'll die for you anyway. Why? Because he wants us to live with him in heaven forever. And that's the attitude he wants us to have for others. What do we expect sinners to do, lost sinners to do, but, well, act like lost sinners and respond like lost sinners and sin against us like, well, lost sinners? And what's our response to them as saved people? Hopefully it's to reflect the image and the love and the grace and the forgiveness of Jesus to them. And so if we can figure out how to really bring in fullness that mindset, then it helps prepare us for those moments when people react against us in negative ways. Because we can look at that negativity as an opportunity. An opportunity for perhaps a door opening, even when they're doing hurtful things like closing doors in your face. But sanctify, verse 15 says again, Set apart Christ as Lord in your hearts, always being ready to make a defense to everyone who asks you to give an account for the hope that is in you, yet with gentleness and reverence. And that is so important, not to be boastful, not to be, you know, burstful, (laughs) but with great gentleness, speak the hope of God in your life. Verse 16, and keep a good conscience so that in the thing in which you are slandered, those who revile your good behavior in Christ may be put to shame. So making sure that we don't respond with a sin, but keep that good conscience, knowing that we're good with God and that's good enough. And so, when they revile you or even hate you for your good behavior and your good responses, it will put them to shame. I mean, isn't that always true? If, you, if you've been a part of an argument, if you've been a part of a situation where you've got one person that's amped up and just angry and sinning and throwing insults, but the one person is calm. And, and if you're an outside observer, you go, how foolish the person who thinks they're in control, who's doing all the yelling and shouting, who wants to who who be the dominant person in the situation, they're the one, they're the ones who's looking so foolish. They're, 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 they're the ones who look like they're they're filled with shame because the one who's receiving these 
this reviled stuff. They're, they're the ones who are quiet and gentle. They're the ones and their behavior that, that's reflecting the good. We've seen situations like that. And, and then when we're the ones in that situation, let us be the ones who reflect the good. Verse 17, for it is better if God should will it so that you suffer for doing what is right rather than doing what is wrong. Now verse 18. For Christ also died for sins once for all, the just for the unjust, in order that he might bring us to God, having been put to death in the flesh, but made alive in the Spirit. Oh, amen. Now we're going to end here because I want to take my time in this next section. So I hope that from this section you get further challenges, and I know that I am, for areas of response that I need to really work on so that when that real life moment of emotion comes out, where I'm being pressured or pushed on or attacked, or there's a suffering moment from somebody else toward me, that I respond with these attributes. Now, I'm going to pray over them. I hope you do too. I'm going to study them out further. I hope that you do as well. And I want to try to place them in my life so that they will be my response. Let's close with a prayer. Father, thank you for giving us this opportunity once again to receive further instruction from you on how to behave, on how to be equipped, how to be strengthened to respond as we face challenging situations in life. We thank you for these instructions. And I pray that we do more than just listen to them, but we are, are doers of your word. And when we are, we'll watch you work in ways that will open up lives to you. We thank you for Jesus. It is through him that we pray. Amen. You folks have a wonderful and blessed night.